Um, and, you know, we're so excited to have them. We want to cover a few subjects that reader or viewers have written in about, about COVID and also about their new book, which I was super excited to read. I have it here, The Case Against Socialism. Um, Rand and his wife, Kelly, did this book together. Uh, so first of all, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us, guys. Yeah, thank you, guys. So first thing I want to dive into is before we get into the book, because I have a lot of thoughts on the book, it's incredible, and every child in America should have to read this book in school. Um, but before we jump in there, I want to talk about COVID because um, I got so many people asking about the COVID numbers, and they want to know, you know, are these numbers something that we can trust? Because we saw just today, I have a news story says 3,500 cases from San Antonio alone um, have been thrown out. Um, and then we've gotten Florida over a dozen labs reporting 100% positive rates. And that's just, that's not, that's nonsensical. We all know that we're not at 100% positive in all of these labs. And we're not talking about one test. We're talking about hundreds of tests, which when you put them all together, we're talking about thousands and thousands of tests. And then we have, you know, cases like we saw yesterday, there's a grandfather who's tested 11 times positive for COVID and that counts as 11 different cases. So is that something that the public can trust when they're looking at just the rate, you know, how many cases there are versus the mortality rate? You know, I think it's hard to know when you're looking at cases, whether they're being multiple counts of uh, individual cases, but really what's probably more important is how serious this is. I mean, each year, uh, maybe a couple hundred million people might get a cold, but we don't count the cases. It's, it's the severity of the result that's more important. So I think deaths are important. And I think following the death curve, um, we should have some comparisons. Everybody's saying New York's a fabulous success and Florida's a disaster. Well, it's actually the opposite. You know, if you look at New York's death rate, it's about 1,600 per million. If you look at Florida's death rate, it's about 200 per million. So one eighth the death rate. And even if Florida still suffers a lot more in the next couple of months or so, I don't think they can get anywhere nearly as bad as it happened in New York. And in fact, the worst public policy, public health decision of all of this had to have been Cuomo deciding to send uh, coronavirus patients that were positive back to the nursing home. So I think there should be less concern about how many people have it, because I think what we're going to discover, we don't know all this yet, but I think what we're going to discover is that a much younger set of people is getting this. The average age is going down. And I think the lethality numbers, the mortality is going to go way down over time. And really, since we don't have a vaccine, the one way we get immunity is by having more people get it. And I don't think it can be said enough what a positive thing it is to have millions of people who now have immunity because they essentially are now blocking the spread of the virus. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that um, we were talking about before, before we came on today is the vaccine, because there seems to be this push against, you know, looking at other alternatives, looking at therapies and this idea that a vaccine is going to fix everything. And the reality is, this is the most rushed vaccine in history. So do you have any concerns about that? Because from our end, just as parents, you know, not even as a political thing, but just as sort of a common sense thing, I don't feel entirely comfortable having my child be a guinea pig for something that's going to be the most rushed in history. I would like to see long-term safety studies before I do that, especially given the fact that for kids under 18, the risk they're taking of actually dying is one in a million. So, you know, well, in do a, you think in a, that- in a free society, Basically in a free society, every individual family and every individual weighs the risks of the vaccine versus the risks of the disease. I frankly think hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people will sign up immediately, particularly if they're high risk. So your child is has a mortality rate of about one in a million or less, but your grandparents who are in their 80s might have a, a risk much higher. They may yep. choose voluntarily to get vaccinated. So everybody makes a decision, but it should be by persuasion. And I'll give you an example. The first smallpox vaccine was live and very dangerous, but so was the disease. In the first 50 years of the live vaccine, you get to the Revolutionary War and George Washington knew enough about how bad smallpox was that he made Martha and the rest of the family before they came to visit him get the smallpox vaccine. So I'm kind of pro-vaccine, but I'm also pro-freedom. And basically the higher risk people will make a choice and a lot of them will get it. And then we'll study that over six months, a year, two years. But the other thing is, look, there's millions of us like me now who are immune. Are they going to hold yep. me down and stick a needle in my arm? They probably will because these people believe in the idea that they are so right and that their cause is so righteous that they can inflict it on others, which is sort of leads into the book a little bit, that people believe that they're so right that they can inflict their will upon others, which is essentially socialism. Right. 
Um, let's talk about that. So let's segue in, you know, you said in the book that socialism, you know, makes these promises of equality, but really is inevitably a uh, path towards tyranny. What are some of the ways that they use the bait and switch as we're kind of seeing now with figures like AOC and Bernie to pull on us? How do we not see this coming? Yeah, I mean, they really focus on not the fact that capitalism has really made the United States the richest, the most prosperous. We have the best health outcomes. We have the longevity. We have all of these positives, but they want to focus on inequality. Where, whereas, yes, we do have very wealthy people and very poor people in this country. But under socialism, the powerful people become the, the powerful people in government actually enrich themselves. And that's the, the little secret they don't want to tell you. The other thing is, while we do have inequality in terms of money income, in terms of consumption here in the United States, uh, statistics, uh, FEE, the Foundation for Economic Equality, did a great study and they used World Bank figures. The bottom 20% of income earners in the United States, our poorest 20%, actually consume more goods and services than the median income earners in the richest countries in the world outside of the US, like you know, England, Germany, France, Sweden, the Nordic countries. So you really, it, it's kind of like Apple, it's not really apples to apples to say that we have income inequality compared to say Jeff Bezos or all of our super wealthy. Look at what our poorest 20%, how they actually live, and you'll see that it's better than most people in European countries. The other point is this, is we have great economic mobility. They talk about the top 1%. They're not the same people every year. Those who make a million dollars this year, about 50% of them won't make a million next year. It'll be a new crop of people who does. Those who are earning in the bottom 20%, over half of them make it up to the next 20%. A third mm -hmm. of them make it all the way up the ladder. So the ladder is very mobile. The other thing you have to ask yourself when people dwell on income inequality is, would you rather live in a society where the poorest people on average make 10,000 and the richest make 50,000? Or would you rather live in a society where the poorest makes 50,000 and the richest make 10 million? So really it, it's, a, it's about envy if you talk about income inequality. It should be about your circumstances. It shouldn't about be about your circumstances compared to other people. That's just jealousy. That's a jealousy trope that really has no place in this. The other thing about income inequality that they won't tell you and that has really been misstated is that you do get economic growth with income inequality. It doesn't stifle economic growth for the country. We have more income inequality, but would you rather live in a country like Ethiopia that has less income inequality that's very poor, where everybody is poor, equally poor? That's sort of the idea of socialism versus capitalism in essence. I think another point that is repeatedly made on the left, which is false, is that somehow they perpetuate this idea that the rich are not paying their fair share, that they are somehow, you know, skating all responsibility for society. And we make that point in the book as well. You know, the top 1% in the United States of income earners actually pays 40% of the federal income tax, 40%, 1% pays 40%. So they are paying their fair share. If you look at countries like Sweden and some of the Scandinavian countries that are always sort of, you know, pointed to by the left as the ideal, they actually yeah. have a much more progressive tax than we do. In other words, their highest income tax rate, say, for example, in Denmark is 60 percent. But you start paying that at sixty thousand dollars a year. So if you are a middle income earner in Denmark, making 60000 a year, you pay 60% in income tax. In the United States, we are much more, um, what's, we, we actually skew it more toward our high income earners paying a much higher percentage of our federal income tax. Right? Yep, and you actually, you, you're going right into the area I wanted to go with these Nordic systems. So that's probably the number one argument that I hear from young people who are confused about socialism. Mm -hmm. And they say, what about the Scandinavian countries? And they're unaware of the fact that, you know, one of those countries has Norway has the largest so sovereign wealth fund in the world, you know, and it's basically derived all of its income off of the backs of U.S. capitalists, you know, and they're heavily they've been heavily invested in U.S. fossil fuels. That's where they made their money for their social programs. It all came from capitalism. But if you had to explain to a young person and you had three minutes to do it to prove to them that, look, this is not socialism, what Bernie's selling you, what AOC are mm -hmm. selling, is selling you is not socialism, how would you make that argument to them? 
Well, it's all a lie. Basically, Sweden's not a socialist country. When you do rankings of freedom as far as trade and economies, Sweden actually ranks on the top 10 as far as freest societies. You have private ownership there. You actually have uh, taxes that are different than ours. Their corporate taxes are very low. So Bernie Sanders is for increasing the corporate tax in America, but actually we've just now lowered it to get close to Sweden. Sweden's had low corporate taxes for 20 or 30 years. Sweden has been running away from socialism for the last 20 or 30 years. Sweden doesn't actually tax the rich, as Kelly was pointing out. They tax the lower class. They have a sales tax called a VAT that is 25% on all goods for everybody, including food and medicines. So what you find is, is that really they don't have any of the things that Bernie actually advocates for. They're not socialist. They're actually private and free market. They have a big government. And what they do have is a welfare state, which is much bigger than ours, but they don't get it by taxing the rich. So it's also a lie. When they say we're going to top the tax, top 1% or AOC says we're going to have a 70% tax on those with more than $10 million, it brings in about $50 billion. But if you ask them what the cost of all their programs would be, it's like $50 trillion. So there's a basic math problem. But the bottom line is Sweden is not a great example. But we go one step further in the book in the sense that we say that the idea is that socialism can be benign are not true also, that you can have an electoral or a democratic socialism just frankly isn't true. That basically once socialism occurs and once you finally get to where the government's going to own the property, they have to take it from someone. So I taught a course on the dystopian novel and the students kept asking me, is it inevitable that socialism leads to violence? And that's a theme of the book. Yes, it's inevitable because when you select a socialist leader, if you get a soft leader, that leader won't be strong enough to take the property. So if you truly want socialism, where they're going to have the means of production, the houses, the land, everything like they did in the Soviet Union or in Cuba, you have to select for a ruthless dictator. So it's actually not an accident that you get a ruthless dictator. It's actually part of the natural selection of socialism. If you want to take take people's property, they don't willingly give it up. You got to take it from them. And inevitably that implies or necessitates violence or force. Yeah, and I, I want to say just from a, a personal standpoint, you know, my family came from Cuba. My mom's a Cuban refugee. Um, they had everything stolen from them. And I'd say even in Cuba's case, although we know, you know, looking backwards that Fidel Castro was absolutely a ruthless dictator, when he was coming up, that was not the case in a lot of Cubans' eyes. He had done a lot of the sort of what we referred to before as the bait and switch, where he baited people in with this idea that he was for the people. You know, um, and that's what they always do. It's always we're for the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the same imagery we even see coming from people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We see her pushing out imagery that makes it look like the Green New Deal is for the people and that these ideas that they have and that they're, you know, they're really pushing through their movements like Sunrise Movement and things like that. They're making it look like each one is for the people. But in reality, you look at somebody like Fidel Castro, um, you can even delve into the propaganda here, which is something else you talk about in the book that, you know, socialism inevitably leads to corruption. And when you look at somebody like Fidel Castro in Cuba, he actually owned a home to make it look like he was living like the people. But in reality, he had amassed about a billion dollars and had his own private mansions in other places and had this incredible fortune that he's then, you know, given to all of his cronies and to his family and, you know, so on and so forth. And it also touches on the other aspect of socialism that in the U.S., our 1% changes. In places like Cuba or the Soviet Union, you have the same oligarchs. You know, it was all about a system of power. You're exactly right. And so a lot of the young people in our country are complaining about the top 1%. Well, our top 1% are at least based on merit. So, for example, the Walton family are in the top 1%. Did they get there by stealing our money? No, we voluntarily went to Walmart because they had cheaper products, quality products, great distribution, and we still go to Walmart and they become rich by giving us something we want. Fidel Castro, though, became rich and his cronies, the top 1%, the upper crust, are friends of Castro. And they're friends of a guy who's never, he's, he's president for life. And so there is a difference, but there's always a top 1%. Would you rather it be based on merit? like in our country, it's not always merit. I mean, there's luck involved and inheritance and things like that, but at least we have merit predominating. In their country, what predominates is the cronyism, the kleptocracy. Yeah, you know, I I interviewed a a Cuban-American in the book and um, 
you know, this person did not want their name revealed because they still have family members living yep. in Cuba. And uh, they described over and over again, just the heartbreak of the ration coupons and how there was just so little, they were pretty much, they're dictated every week what they can buy. And this person said, you know, there are no ration coupons for the government elites. There are no ration coupons for the military. Uh, so the government lives by a completely different standard. And those who who yearn for socialism and think that somehow there are going to be these people that are going to be fair to everyone is a complete falsehood. The other thing that, yeah. that they were saying is they actually traveled to Cuba recently to visit and, you know, their taxi driver was an engineer because yes, you know, quote unquote, education is free, but you study what the government wants you to and doctors make between 25 and $50 a month. And so they drive taxis on the side to, to be able to feed their kids. One of my favorite stories or anecdotes, a little joke about how socialism and scarcity and rationing goes, is a guy goes into the store and he says, are you the store that doesn't have any butter? And they say, no, 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 that's the store across the street. That we're the store that doesn't have any toilet paper. The <laughs> store across the street's the one that doesn't have any butter. But it, uh, scarcity and rationing, but I think of it even in this coronavirus epidemic, there's no toilet paper. Why is there no toilet yeah. paper? Because the government has completely screwed up our economy and mm -hmm. uh, there's no meat. You know, the things are, it's a, it's an amazing disaster, all created by government. And instead of fixing it by opening up the economy, they say, we're going to throw more money at it, but they act as if there's money somewhere. I, I've been joking. Oh, do you think we're going to go over to the Federal Reserve and open the big safe and they'll get all that money out and then we'll put it in the mail and send it to you? There is no money, no rainy day fund, no savings, no money at all. We're just going to borrow it, borrow it from our kids and grandkids, borrow it from the Chinese, borrow it from foreign countries, and then we're going to mail it out to you. And if, if that works, why don't we do it all the time? In fact, that's what Bernie Sanders and the left has wanted. And now the coronavirus has made the right identical to the left. And there's almost no conservatives left in Washington. There's a handful. It's a great disappointment to me. Right. I think that's an indictment on our education system. And I wanted to talk about that because we've, you know, seemingly as conservatives just allowed this to happen. And we really have to talk about how we slow back that that process. We have a generation of kids that don't even know what actual socialism is. They've completely washed the history of, you know, socialist countries, the truth about Mao, the truth about Hitler. I mean, kids today even think that Hitler wasn't a part of the Socialist Party. That wasn't his party. What can you say to our education system and maybe the the intersection of uh, global alarmism and using climate as a means of propaganda, how they've combined those two, education and, and climate alarmism propaganda to reach our children to implement these socialist ideas? I think they're really using a lot of fear tactics. I mean, the climate alarmism is definitely one. They're trying to appeal to emotion over and over again instead of looking at complex issues. And then we have the mainstream media, of course, silencing any dissent by labeling people deniers. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing statues torn down across the country and some of them are of abolitionists and people are so ignorant. I mean, the young people that are tearing down these statues have no idea of what's going on in history. Um, I do think that we all need to wake up. I mean, as parents, people need to be showing up at school board meetings. We need to be challenging this orthodoxy that's being kind of pushed down our kids' throats um, that, you know, as parents, we need to stand up and really know what our kids are being taught. Yep. Yeah, and I don't, I would tell every parent, don't assume that private schools are going to save you because we've gone to private schools for our kids and you have to be willing to pull your kids because some of the stuff that they're teaching, like just recently, at a school book fair, it was a pro Karl Marx book was being recommended to kids. Like my wife said earlier, we've had a science teacher tell our kids that it's a fact that in 10 years, we're going to warm 10 degrees in that period of time. Even the furthest left climate scientist doesn't claim that to be the case, you know, but they're teaching that as a fact to kids and scaring them into this idea that they're going to die in 10 years, you know, beyond yeah. that, you know, you have things like teachers who are able to celebrate people like Che Guevara. He had a poster up in our daughter's Spanish teacher's class in a position of honor because the teacher admired him. These are things that shouldn't be happening in America. Um, it's a great disservice to our kids. So what do we do to, to sort of slow the progress they've made or roll it back? Mm -hmm. Well, so you know, this battle has been going on for a long time. Back in the 1970s, the big government Republicans and the Democrats said, we need to nationalize education and make it better. And we need a department of education. 
So Reagan fought against this and a lot of us supported Reagan. My dad supported Reagan. Reagan wins. And who does he appoint to be head of the Department of Education? A guy that's all for it. The Department of Education doubles under Reagan. This is sort of the disappointment of politics. You elect someone on one premise, they appoint the wrong people and it gets worse. And so now the Department of Education has grown, grown, grown. And really part of the answer is to decentralize education, which would have mean the same as many of us have called for for decades, abolish the Department of Education, send it back to the states. Then you could have the fight at your local school board. But you should have many choices. The more competition, the better. So I would say you need the choice of private schools. Your taxpayer dollars are yours. They should be given to you in the form of a voucher, and you should be able to take them wherever you want. Private school, home school, you name it. But the more competition, the better. And then the other thing is, is that people who want to understand the world and history and be part of shaping the future need to read. And that's the problem. Everybody's got it with their kids now. They're so absorbed in video games and the here and now and uh, the quickness of, of the computer that people aren't reading books and people don't know about history. So they have a poster of Che Guevara because they have no idea who he yeah. is. They think he played for the Rolling Stones or something. They have no idea who he is. <laughs> yep. And I would say this. If there's conservative billionaires listening, the money's being spent in the wrong places. You want to change America. You want conservatism to win for generations, focus on culture. This book should be in every library. You should have bought just countless copies and put it in every library, every school across America that will take the donation. That's number one, because if you go into school right now, you're going to find, you'll find books on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You'll find books on Obama and it, there'll be glowing books. I mean, just glowing and if you look at our media, you know, if you take your kid to see Dora the Explorer movie, this is the subtlety of the left and how they sort of are able to turn a generation against another group of people without explicitly saying it. You know, you take your daughter or your son to see Dora the Explorer movie. It's a cute movie. But what you may not realize going through it, if you're not politically awake and you don't realize what's going on, is there's three different references to Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the movie, all celebratory, saying that she is the champion of women's rights. They never explicitly talk about party, but that's that's not necessary because that'll be done later on, because later on they'll learn who she is, who what political ideology she's aligned to. And they don't really need to know any facts. They don't need to know where she stood on anything. All they need to know is the media told them throughout their life through multiple impressions in a subtle way that she was amazing and that she was for them. So that's one of the things that, you know, if you're going to spend money, change the culture, invest in changing the culture. And at this point in time, you know, you talk about in the book how socialism requires a, a majority, a supermajority. And the only way to get that is to deplatform. Well, we're seeing that right now in real time. They're deplatforming artists, they're deplatforming just regular people from these social media platforms for having wrong think. The same thing happens in entertainment. You know, I come from that world. I've directed Oscar winning actors, Oscar winning actresses. And I can tell you, people who are conservative are afraid. They won't even say anything. And it's because that separate ecosystem doesn't exist. You want family values to come through entertainment and to be able to permeate culture. You have to invest in creating a separate ecosystem. Don't you think that's important? Yeah, and I think all along, whenever I talk to people of means and they're trying to help to be create a better society, the short term is politics, trying to elect better people in Washington. The longer term is education, foundations for education. And so there are a lot of uh, good organizations out there. Uh, Foundation for Economics, uh, Education and Economics is a good one. Cato is another good one. Human Hum Progress. Humanprogress.org we mentioned in the book. And I think it's really uh, tells a truth that you aren't hearing because the news is full of so much pessimism. There's a statistic, and we quote it in the book, that in about 1820, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, virtually 90% of the world lived in subsistence, in poverty, extreme poverty, $2 a day. If you look at that number now in same dollars, when I was born in the 1960s, it was about a third of the world. So we went from 90% of the world to only a third of the world living in extreme poverty. Today, it's less than 10%. Would you believe that listening to the news? Everything is so terrible, this and that. If you talk about what money buys and you look at constant dollars, like a worker in the 1950s had to work about 120 hours to buy a refrigerator, now can do it with about 16 hours. If you look at how much food someone bought in 1919, they buy seven times more food with the same amount of average worker hours now. So it's just amazing the good things that are going on. And really, I think in a lot of ways, the country is so much better. We're consumed right now with the ideas of race. 
I think that racial relations in many ways are better than they've ever been. We have more intermarriage. We have more integration in churches, voluntary integration. Our communities are so much better than they ever were, better than when I was a kid, better than my parents were a kid. But the media is portraying us as if everybody's hateful out there. And it's like, I think it's a much better world than it used to be. Are there no, are there still problems? Sure. There are still problems and we should fix those problems, but we shouldn't act as if we live in like 19, uh, 30s Alabama or something. We live in a much better place. And we need to remember 1930s Alabama was run by the Democrats. We also need to remember that the cities now that are suffering and that have some of this police brutality problem are all run by Democrats. How did right. Republicans somehow the media blames Republicans? And it's like, why don't we get new Democrats? Why don't we get new Republicans? Why don't we get new people running our cities? I mean, here's a good example. In Minneapolis, run by Democrats since the 1970s, they had eight police officers in like the last couple of years that were bad police officers. That's not many, but they should be punished. Well, they've got to be punished and they went through the union process. The union appeals process got six out of eight reinstated, including a guy who broke the nose of a teenager who was in handcuffs. Well, whose fault is that? It's not there. It's a Democrat governor, a Democrat uh, mayor, and somehow they want to say that's Republicans fault. No, we need to get in their face and let them know it is really the fault of a party who isn't doing anything to make it a better place. I mean, the, the little girl, the cute little girl that died in Atlanta, so, so Coria Turner last week, it's like, oh my God, what are they doing? They're doing that because they're just giving up and saying, you know, thugs can rule our city. And this little girl and her mom drive down the street and get shot in a car, you know. And, and they, took a, they took a wrong turn off the interstate. And if that road had not been run over, by protesters at that point it was rioters it was late at night and the mom is desperately trying to turn around and that's when it happened so that is the fault of the mayor for not controlling the city and reducing you know, we shouldn't have cities just you know uh, streets being run over and barricaded like they are in portland and seattle um you know to rand's point i think we're hearing now the sort of the narrative on the left is somehow this is all because of trump or or Republicans. And as we were talking earlier, we wrote about in the book, you know, Rand and I have been speaking out for criminal justice reform. Rand, since he was elected 10 years ago, I mean, he's sponsored or co-sponsored more bills than anyone on this issue for 10 years. Uh, my father-in-law, Ron Paul, used to talk, uh, you know, over a decade ago about the unintended consequences of the war on drugs. Uh, but I don't see any responsibility from them. I mean, really, we, we wrote about uh, Eric Garner in our book. You know, he was killed over six years ago. He said 11 times, I cannot breathe while he was being choked to death on the streets of New York. And who was the mayor? Bill de Blasio. Who was the governor? Cuomo. Who was the attorney general? Eric Holder. Who was president? Barack Obama. And guess what? Eric Garner's killer not only was never uh, accused or indicted of any crime, he remained on the NYPD for five years after Eric Garner's death. Maybe if they had done something, maybe if they had done something then, we wouldn't be in this situation now. But what is Bill, Bill de Blasio doing? He's spending his time painting Black Lives Matter on well, the street. And the, and the Eric Garner thing is an example of how it's policy and bad people sometimes intersecting. So the policy was like $5 a pack uh, tax on cigarettes. So you create a black market. And that's what he was accused of is selling single Lucy, single cigarettes, which he actually wasn't doing that day. And you don't deserve to die for any of that. But it's the same thing. You have that and then it gets directed. And then it has a racial disparity in the outcome. Same as the war on drugs. You have no knock raids, which is a bad policy. And then it intersects sometimes with bad policing. But you need to change the rules on this. And so Democrats haven't been very good, haven't been very vocal on no-knock raids till just recently. But I think a no-knock raid where someone busts your door down in the middle of the night is a bad idea. You know, Absolutely. and I think the thing is drugs are bad. They hurt people who use them. But really busting doors down the middle of the night, someone's going to get shot. Either the police or the people inside are going to get shot. It's just not a good idea. Um, but once again, most of the policies in most of these cities have been run by Democrats. And we need to figure out how to get people to listen beyond that and listen to that there are other alternatives in our cities. Yep. And that's the irony in this is that Democrats, because of the propaganda that's just filled in, in every aspect of our media, the propaganda is so deep that the idea is that Republicans are against all this stuff. The Republicans are behind all the brutality. They're behind all of this, this sort of like overarching um, 
law enforcement that's that, that, that's coming and intruding into their life. The reality is these are all happening in Democrat cities, you know, and Republicans, you know, you look at just the phrase Black Lives Matter. It That in itself is a good case study on this. Black Lives Matter as a statement is something that none of us would disagree with. You know, of course, Black Lives Matter. You know, that's that's if you said that about any race, I would say that's true. But it's the organization Black Lives Matter. And they confuse the two. And the media does that intentionally because they want people to then push back and say, hey, you know what? Actually, there's a problem here. You know, the founder of this organization uh, is an avowed Marxist, said as recently as this month, you know, and said that Marxism is the goal. They'll cut you off before you even get to make that point. And instead, they'll just say, you don't agree with Black Lives Matter, right. you know, and, and that it permeates. Also gets, and it also society. gets to whether it's a good place or a bad place. Is America a good place or a bad place? If it's a terrible place and everybody hates each other and it's all about racism and prejudice, why don't we just transform it into, you know, a new Sweden or socialism yeah. or some other thing? Why don't we get rid of everything instead of understanding that history, we have a mixed past, we have a mixed history and there's good and bad, but overwhelmingly what a, uh, what a success America is and has gotten more so over the time. Yes. I'm the first to admit we had problems, you know, separate but equal was wrong. Brown versus the board fixes that in 1950, 50 years ago. We, did, we didn't have good voting. We have much better voting now. But we shouldn't say that we're still living in the 1960s in Alabama or Mississippi. Uh, blacks and whites are voting equally in Mississippi and Alabama now. There isn't sort of this massive thing to prevent people. From, there was that at a time. It was a bad part of our history. But to, to, to try to tell people that's still where we are is just not true. But it also doesn't help us to get to a better place to keep saying exactly. we're back in the 1960s in Alabama and Mississippi. We got to get beyond that. And I think people have to tell the truth about what's going on. And things aren't nearly as bad as everybody's making it out to be. Well, I think what one of the things that bothers me the most is we actually just last year, a year and a half ago, had achieved real progress on criminal justice reform. You know, yeah. President Trump signed the First Step Act. Uh, I am personally friends with Alice Marie Johnson. She and I have spoken on panels together on criminal justice reform. Uh, this was a woman whose sentence was commuted by President Trump. It was a life sentence. Uh, Rand recently wrote about conspiracy laws and how they swoop people up, often more, more often probably people of color in, in the war on drugs. She had um, never committed any crimes before. She had lost her home, went, gone through a divorce agreed to make phone calls in an, in an interstate drug deal, and she got a life sentence for a first offense. And, uh, you know, she did so many things in prison. She had a prison ministry. She did choreography. She was a, a mentor to so many other people. She's an amazing woman. Um, you know, President Obama had eight years to do something on criminal justice reform. He mm -hmm. did nothing. Um, you know, the First Step Act, you know, kind of fixing, fixing a lot of our problems with mandatory minimums and uh, closing the disparity um, and making it retroactive of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine that also had so many African-Americans were getting these draconian sentences because of that. It was a first step, but it was a real step forward. And this was just a year and a half ago, but everyone seems to have forgotten that we we are working on these things, and that it was you know that it was Republicans who were who were sounding the alarm. A lot of red states have been working on these things. Our state of Kentucky, we passed uh, the Dignity Bill, which uh, finally allowed you know unshackling of pregnant women behind bars while they're giving birth, uh, providing you know health and hygiene products to women behind bars. Just a lot of basic dignity issues are, are being dealt with. So. Progress has been made, and I feel I feel like one of the things that's just so unsettling to me now is that so much of the progress is being swept under the rug, and now they're calling for full-on Marxism and the destruction of the nuclear family and defunding of police. I was actually talking to Alice Marie Johnson, and she, you know, she was on um, Hannity, and she said, you know, this is a woman who got an unfair life sentence, and she's like, absolutely not. I am not in favor of defunding the police. You know, a lot of my family and friends live in neighborhoods where we count on police protection. We want police yeah. protection. We are not in favor of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I know you guys have a hard out, but you made, I mean, you made so many great points. We could talk to you guys for probably hours upon hours um, because I think you guys are just, you're, you're exactly in the lane and care about the things that we care about, which says that, you know, I think you guys are really in touch with 
what voters care about right now. And I hope that we see a focus on all of these issues going into 2020 in every race in the Republican Party, because this is the stuff that people want to talk about. Um, and that's what's it's kind of reassuring to me, at least that at least we know we have one senator up there. You know, and I'm sure there's more, but at least we have one that we know is fighting on these issues. Um, I'll leave you with one question from a viewer. They asked, are you in favor of legalizing marijuana in Kentucky? <laughs> um, I think that really you should not be punished with incarceration for choosing to use uh, marijuana. Um, that's a little bit of a way of getting around the issue in the sense I don't think there should be criminal penalties. I haven't really been advocating. I've got so many things that I'm for. I haven't been you know, stomping around saying, oh, we've got to legalize, we've got to legalize. The first yeah. thing I think as a step forward is to try to decriminalize. That means taking away the penalties. And um, I still think that I don't want to be seen as an advocate for young people smoking marijuana. I, I think that... Um, you know, there is some stunting to it. Uh, there, there's some stunting to learning and I just don't think it's good for kids. I don't want to be seen as that advocate, but I also don't like to see people locked up and put in jail for it. And I think that's been a mistake for our country. So that, that's sort of where I am. I think that's a great position. Yeah. So I, I thank you guys so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, um, you know, we'll have you guys anytime, anywhere. You guys are incredible. I hope maybe we'll see you guys when you come to Tennessee. Yeah, sounds We're good. Right up the road. Thanks. Thank you awesome. guys. Thank awesome. you both so much. So thank you guys for joining us today. We, um, you know, we just, I think they're incredible. I yeah. think they're incredible. I encourage you all to buy their book, The Case Against Socialism. We'll have a link in uh, YouTube at the bottom for you guys to be able to purchase it. Um, follow, subscribe. Don't forget, tell your friends about the show, send them the interview. Um, you know, I hate doing this stuff. I hate being like the marketer person that's like, do this, do that. But any way you can support us, please do so. Um, we really just want to get the truth out to people and have these deeper conversations. Right. And it's so important for us to be heard because we talk about all these great points and anybody that has any logic left in their brain would hear these points and go, wow, I had no idea that Republicans are fighting for this. I had no idea Republican values were this, that they stood for this, that they accomplished this. Yep. And the messaging has to get through. And this is a perfect example of what socialism has to do. They have to silence. They have to purge people speaking out people sharing better ideas because that's the only way their ideology survives. Yep. So what do we have to do? We have to keep pushing this messaging through, keep breaking through those algorithms and share. That's why it's more important than ever to share this content, share any content, yep. you know, if, even if it is in our show of, of something that is standing for your values, you have to share it if yep. you want it to penetrate culture. Yep. So we, we can't be that afraid message. that there's, I think one of the biggest mistakes that, um, you know, and I'm very fair, I'll criticize anybody on any side of the aisle. And I would say one of the mistakes Trump has made is the constant harping on the silent majority, because we can't afford to be silent anymore. I know for some people, it feels like I just can't do it. I'm going to get fired from my job or this or that. I understand if you're in a really, really extreme situation, but for the vast majority of us, we can still find a way to support what we believe in. Mm -hmm. Even if you can't voice your support, you know, give monetarily or anonymously on the weekend, go support the local GOP and, you know, hand out signs or be on a phone bank. You don't even have to leave your house. You can do a digital phone bank with Scott Pressler, you know, mm -hmm. and he'll give you a list of people to call in a, an area that's a purple, you know, swing county. And you can call and be supportive of whatever Republican candidate is there. We all can do something is sort of my point. Um, and last thing I'll tell you guys before we sign off is that I did see some people write in asking about the I am Republican shirt I was wearing recently. You can get that. Um, a lot of you are watching on Periscope. So if you're watching there, you have to go to the YouTube page and there's a store there. Or our website, um, or walklive.com. Yeah. And that also has the most updated uh, Trump accomplishment PDF that people have asked about too on like social media. Like a million media. times. It's now been yeah. viewed two million times. Yes, two so. million views. Uh, how many downloads? It's over a million downloads. Oh, yeah, so, and million downloads, then so. one of the most incredible things is we have gotten emails from all over the country of people saying, "Hey, I went and I printed out 500 copies, and we distributed it at a Walmart, or we distributed it outside of a grocery store." Um, and that's one of the most incredible things that people have done because if you just take that list, it takes the politics and the tweets and the attitudes and personalities out of it. And it just goes straight into policy. Mm -hmm. So you leave those at people's front doors. You leave them in their mailboxes. People get to read for themselves on their own time. And that's when people can admit to themselves they were wrong about somebody. Right. If you have a conversation and an argument with somebody saying, you're wrong about Trump, this is why you're wrong, people automatically feel like I need to defend my position. 
-hmm. If you just hand them information and it's with love and they can do it on their own time, that can change more hearts and minds than anything. So um, thank you guys for watching. We appreciate all of you and we'll keep fighting for the truth. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day.